Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard and today we're gonna to be covering some Akhenaten fundamentals, namely how actors process messages. This is one of the most important things you need to understand about actors in order to use them effectively. So let's dive in by taking a look at some Akhenaten source code. This is what a really basic user-defined actor might look like. We implement the untyped actor base class, and that just means we have to implement this abstract on receive method. This is where all of the messages we're gonna process get handled by default. Uh, we also have a little bit of internal state, this hello counter, and we have access to the Akhenaten logging system. And all we're doing here is using a little C-sharp switch statement to go ahead and handle any messages that come in. If they're a string, we'll go ahead and log it, increment the counter. If it's anything else, we're gonna hand it over to the unhandled messages method, which will by default on Akhenaten.net uh, log a warning and then publish this message on the message bus as a type of unhandled message, basically. So this is what really basic actor code looks like, and this is what people think of when they think of actors. However, there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes than most developers realize. That's what we're gonna to try to get into in this video. When you start an actor, you can't just new up your actor class. You have to use the props abstraction inside Akka.net, which is basically the formula we have for starting actors. Props are immutable, so they can be used over and over again throughout many different actor types if you want. And they also support other different configuration properties, such as you can specify a router. If you want to run like a group of five of these actors that are all load balanced, you can do a custom dispatcher or a mailbox. We'll have some more videos getting into some details on that later. But that's what props is for. It's meant to basically be a recipe for how to start an actor. Well, in order to actually start the actor, we have to feed props into the actor of method, which you can find on the actor system or inside of another actor. So we're gonna tell the actor system in this case to start this actor. Uh, we're also gonna give this actor a name that's optional. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. And we're going to get an actor reference in return. Now this top method is using Akka hosting, which is the recommended way for starting actors. And you can find more about that up here, or there's also a link in the description as well. Likewise, if you wanted to run this without Akadot hosting, let's say you're doing bare bones, bare bones without using any of the Microsoft extension stuff, this is what that same code would look like down here. You typically have one actor system per process. So this is how we start an actor. What's really going on behind the scenes though? Well, an actor is more than just your code. First is the actor cell. This is the real guts of the actor. This is where the actor's identity and location really exist inside the actor system. And the actor cell is what connects all these other components together to form your Akka.net actors. The actor reference, which is the handle we use for communicating with this actor, the actor reference actually points to the actor cell. Every time we send a message to an actor reference, that's going to actually deliver a message to a method on the actor cell. The actor cell in turn is going to enqueue that message into the mailbox, which is a thread safe queue of all messages. It's basically a concurrent queue with a little bit of additional dispatching and batching uh, code built into it. The mailbox is going to interact with the dispatcher. The dispatcher is a shared scheduler, typically shared by multiple actors. However, dispatchers are also configurable. So you can do things like have an actor get dispatched on the UI thread of let's say a WPF application, or you can have an actor run on its own dedicated thread if you're doing some sensitive IoT stuff. Typically though, the dispatcher is just the .NET thread pool. The dispatcher is what's responsible for actually getting your actor scheduled to process the messages that are queued up inside the mailbox. Finally, we have props, the formula used for starting this actor. The props get baked into the actor cell. And the reason why we do that is because we need it in order to restart this actor in the event that it throws an unhandled exception. You can learn more about how actors restart in our video up here. We also have a link to that in the description as well. And then finally, there's the actor, which is your actual code. You can think of your actor as all of the message processing instructions and all of the state plus persistence and any other functionality you need to actually do that reliably over let's say the lifespan of your application. So your actor code is just one small part of what actually makes an actor. The actor system and the actor of method is what's responsible for instantiating all these other components and returning them to you in the form of an actor reference. Now, how do actors actually process messages? Well, by default, when you call the tell method on an actor reference, that is actually going to push that message into the actor cell. 
and the actor cell will enqueue this message into the actor's mailbox. The mailbox will then tell the dispatcher, hey, go ahead and schedule this actor for execution. So we're only going to get scheduled once to go ahead and process these messages because the dispatcher can basically make sure the actor processes a burst of up to 30 messages by default. We'll cover that a little bit later. But the basic gist of this is that as we're sending messages to this actor reference, messages are building up inside the mailbox and the actor won't actually process them until later. This tell method doesn't return a task or anything, but it is asynchronous. It's a void method because the processing happens later when the actor gets scheduled for execution. When this begins, we actually go ahead and begin popping the oldest message off the front of the queue and we send it into that on receive method you defined in your untyped actor. Or if you're using a receive actor, these would be your typed receive handlers that are doing all this. So the actor will begin processing this message and once the actor fully processes message one, we'll go ahead and begin processing message two and then we'll process message three and then the actor will be finished executing all of its message handling. When the actor is done handling all the messages in its mailbox, and if it has nothing left to process, the actor will simply go to sleep and it won't use any CPU. It'll get woken up again the next time a message gets sent to this actor. Now when I say go to sleep, that doesn't mean we shut the actor down or dump any of its state. It just means we sit there idle in memory by default. That's what happens when an actor doesn't have any messages to process. If an actor has more than 30 messages that need to get processed, the mailbox will reschedule the actor on the dispatcher again, so it'll get scheduled one more time to continue processing messages inside its mailbox. We don't want to continuously process messages. Let's say this actor has thousands of messages in its mailbox. We don't want to hog the dispatcher the entire time because that'll create starvation problems for actors that are less busy. So in order to implement some fair scheduling, the actor only gets to process a burst of 30 messages at a time, then it has to go back to the end of the dispatcher's work queue before it can get serviced again. This is also how thread management works in modern operating systems, same idea. You can't let one thread hog all the CPU all the time. So some important details about how actors work. Actors can only process one message at a time. This is what fundamentally guarantees thread safety when working with state inside actors. The fact that you can only have one operation executing inside an actor class at any given time. If we broke this guarantee somehow and allowed actors to be re-entrant or whatever, you know, other sort of, let's say, asynchronous design we might come up with, this would mean you'd have to start using things like locks and semaphores again. The whole point of actors is to not need to do that. So that's why we only process messages one at a time. If you wanna have high concurrency with actors, you do that by running lots of actors, not by trying to achieve concurrency necessarily with the single actor. Actors process messages in first in, first out order. This means that if you need five operations completed in a specific order, you send those messages in the order in which you want them performed by the actor. Aka.net's infrastructure guarantees that this will work for in-memory message processing and over the network using Aka.remote as well. Message processing is always asynchronous. Just because your tell method has completed, you know, basically meaning that you've moved past that in your execution, doesn't mean the message has been processed. It means it's been queued for processing at some point in the future. So you don't need to have a task for processing to be asynchronous in .NET. Uh, message processing with the tell method, always async, always. System messages always get processed first. Now, system messages aren't a thing we really get to spend a lot of time talking about here because there's not very many of them in Aka.net and they're mostly used for starting and stopping actors. The two ways you might end up interacting with system messages are using death watch when you call context.watch on an actor, which we'll do another video on uh, at some point in the future, or if you're shutting an actor down. If you send an actor a poison pill, that message goes through the user message queue, which means that that message will appear behind all the other ones that have previously been queued. Whereas if you call context.stop on an actor, that actor will shut down right away. We're gonna do another video on that as well. But that's the one area where you might actually interact with system messages a little bit. Otherwise, there's not very many of them and you don't typically need to worry about them. Actors can process up to 30 messages at a time each time they're scheduled. This allows us to achieve much higher throughputs than if we only process messages one at a time each time we are scheduled. Because this allows us to avoid context switching. Meaning that when we're scheduled, on a single thread, on a single core, 
we can go ahead and do up to 30 things at once, which lets us take advantage of the L1 cache on our CPU. It lets us go ahead and basically keep it, you know, data and other structures and memory that are recently accessed. It's generally just good for the you know, mechanical sympathy of the computer systems that we're working with. So this allows us to achieve much higher throughputs and lower latencies than we would if we're only doing messages one at a time. Our benchmarks show this. You can actually configure this value if you want to, but it's very rare that you will actually need to do that in practice. Lastly, actors can A, wait while they process messages, but you yield execution each time you do this. We have a video right here on async await versus pipe two. These are the two different ways you can kind of interact with tasks while you're processing messages with actors. When you await a message, you actually give up your 30 message, let's say limit you can process. You're going to yield the first time you hit an await. And once the await completes, you get rescheduled again onto the dispatcher. This means that you're not gonna be able to take advantage of some of that, let's say low context switching that you get when you're processing messages more synchronously, but it's sometimes a lot easier to handle certain types of problems by waiting with an actor, such as, let's say if you're doing a lot of complex IO, or let's say you have multiple operations in parallel and you want to make sure they're all completed before you move on to the next thing. It's much easier to do that with an A wait than it is to try to do it with actor behavior switching and all sorts of other programming constructs. So A waiting is fine, but just bear in mind that you're gonna yield execution when you do that. If you're building a really performance sensitive application, this might matter to you. But if you're just getting started with Aka.net, then don't worry about it. Just go ahead and await it and you can performance optimize it later if you need to. That's our intro video on how actors process messages. Make sure you like and subscribe for some of the other tutorial videos we're gonna be releasing. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you for your time.